excited to be here. I'm excited to be able to preach today. Anybody else excited to be here? Oh, that's about three people. Is anyone excited to be here today? All right. So I'm trying something new today, preaching from my laptop. So, so you got to cut me a little slack up here. This is kind of weird for me, but it's good. Um, so as always, it's an honor to be here, an honor to be able to speak. Thank you, Pastor Derek and Nicole, for letting me, giving me this chance again. My name is Jeremy. I am the associate pastor here. And welcome. Welcome to Mercy Point. We're glad that you're here. So today, as we get started, first of all, turn your Bibles to 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. We're going to be reading some today. If you have your Bible, 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. If not, it'll be up on the screen. All right, let's, let's pray first. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the worship this morning. Thank you for everything you've done already. And thank you for your presence here this morning. Lord, I pray you just continue to continue to move in the service. Lord, use me to, to speak your words, nothing else. Lord, touch, your, touch the hearts of your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9 says, Ahab reported to Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the massacre of the prophets. Jezebel immediately sent a messenger to Elijah with her threat. The gods will get you for this, and I'll get even with you. By this time tomorrow, you'll be as dead as any one of those prophets. When Elijah saw how things were, he ran for dear life to Beersheba, far in the south of Judah. He left his young servant there, and then went on into the desert another day's journey. He came to a lone broom bush and collapsed in its shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all, in a jug of water. He ate the meal and went back to sleep. The angel of God came back, shook him awake again, and said, get up and eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. He got up, ate and drank his fill, and set out. Nourished by that meal, he walked 40 days and nights all the way to the mountain of God to Horeb. When he got there, he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. Then the word of God came to him. So Elijah... What are you doing here? So as we start the series today, I need you to look at your neighbor, find a neighbor, and you're going to tell them something. Look at your neighbor. Say, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Now find someone in front of you or behind you. Find someone in front of you or behind you and ask them, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why are you here? So so the title of today's message is, because we're focusing on the what. So God kind of broke this down for me, this question. The title of our series is, What Are You Doing Here? God kind of broke it up into three parts for me. And if you emphasize like each part, you get a whole different question. So today is, What Are You Doing Here? Next week will be, What Are You Doing Here? And then the third week will be, What Are You Doing Here? So, all right. So as we get started, today's title is, What's Your What? What's Your What? So what I mean by that is, What Is Your Purpose? What is your calling? What is what are you supposed to be doing here? Are you doing here? So, I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like you are somewhere you don't belong? Like where you have to take a minute and ask yourself, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? So I had this I had a situation come up a couple months ago, or about a, about a month ago. And something I did not want to do, something I had it was actually a privilege to do, but I didn't want to do it. Um, I was scared, I was nervous, and this was, I had the opportunity to go on a field trip with my son's first grade class. And that's scary to me, okay? I don't want to be around, I can barely control my own, let alone a whole class full. So we get, it was actually at the zoo in Syracuse, so we're sitting there, I got to the school, I'm like, okay, I can do this. I walk in, and there's just like 10 moms. I'm like, oh man, you gotta be kidding me. This is what I was scared of, I told you you should have gone, Janelle. I text her, oh, you got to get here now. I'm not going. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, man. They all know each other. They're talking. They all know each other's kids. I'm like, oh, this is awkward. I'm just standing in the corner. Do we go yet? So standing there, and then a dad walks in. So I'm like, oh, whew, and then one more dad. I'm good. All right. So we get there, finally go. Two full first grade classes load on this bus. And, yes, I rode the bus all the way down. All the way back, a whole hour, about an hour and a half, because the buses don't go that fast. 
So I'm, I get there and we're like, okay, cool. And they told us before that, and I was like, yeah, you'll probably get assigned like two or three kids to watch along with Lincoln, my son. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna lose one. I'm done. I'm gonna lose a kid and they ain't gonna ever let me back. So I'm already petrified of that. And we get there and they're like, okay, here, here's your list of kids. I'm like, okay. So I got Lincoln. I got one other little girl named Serenity. Huh, two kids. I can handle that, right? Just the Syracuse Zoo. I mean, come on. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm good. I can do this. Just two kids. One's my own. I can beat him if I have to. And the other one, I'll, I'll take it easy on. So we're walking through the zoo. We walk all the way around the whole zoo. It's a big zoo. So we walk around the whole thing. And we come up to the end before we go back inside to check out the aquarium and stuff. And we get to the end, and I'm like, I saw it ahead. I'm like, oh, no, this ain't good. There's a merry-go-round at the end. I'm like, oh, man. So we get to, I want to ride. I want to ride. Both of them are hounding me. I want to ride. Come on. And Serenity goes, Mr. Krigbaum, please, can we ride the, the merry-go-round? I'm like, oh, it says you need three tokens. Oh, I don't have any tokens. Sorry. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where to get them. He goes, okay. And her and Lincoln start, you know, going back and forth. Six, six and seven years old, so they're uh, they're nagging on me. And so we end up going to the aquarium. We walk around the whole zoo again because we had time. And we we get back to it again. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> here we go again. And they're like, well, there's a token machine right over there, right there. I'm like, oh, hold on, I'll go see how much they are. So it was three tokens for one person to ride the ride. They were a dollar a piece to ride for this 30 second little tiny merry-go-round. So I'm like, God, sorry guys, I don't have any cash. I, I didn't bring any cash with me. I didn't know I was going to be buying tokens. And they're like, it says on it, you could, it takes credit cards. I'm like, really? I'm like, you guys can't, aren't supposed to read yet. So we walk up, I, I stand in line. There's a line from here to the wall of people waiting to get tokens. And so I get there, I get the six tokens, pay my six dollars, and I'm like, oh man. They go on the ride, they're like, hey. And I send a picture to Janelle, and she goes, you're such a softy. I'm like, listen, they're nagging on me the whole two hours we were there. Go on the ride, right? And we go back, grab our lunch, go find a table to eat, sit down, start eating, just talking, and um, they, the kids start asking each other, well, how many brothers and sisters do you have? And, so Lincoln answers, and then Serenity goes, yeah, I have, um, I have five stepbrothers and sisters. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, you got a lot of siblings. She goes, yeah. She goes, it is cool. And um, she's like, my, my mommy moved up here. We moved, moved up here with my mommy. And I'm like, oh, yeah? And she goes, yeah, my daddy lives in Texas. I'm like, hmm. I go, wow, that's really far away. She goes, yeah. And she goes, well, he told us that he loved his job more than he loved me. And two things happened, okay? Two things at that moment happened. First, I had to pull my sunglasses down so they wouldn't see me crying in the middle of lunch. And second, I knew at that moment what my what was for that day. I knew at that moment that my what was just to give that girl a little, little ray of hope, a little ray of light that she might not get at home. I knew that my what for going on that field trip, whether I liked it or not, was to be a light for that little girl. And, you know, she, at the end of, it, end of the lunch and we were getting ready to leave, she goes, you know what, Mr. Creekbaum? You know what? What's up, Serenity? She goes, you're a cool guy. You dress cool. I like you. You're cool. I go, thank you. Mission accomplished for me. So, and they got to go on the merry-go-round. So, if we look at Elijah in the story and ask, what he was doing where he was and gain a little insight into what he was doing in his life. So to get the full context of what we're talking about in chapter 19, I'm going to backtrack for a second and just fill you in on chapter 18. Well, chapter 18 is a crazy chapter, and if you haven't read it, I'd say go read it this week. Um, but to summarize it, uh, they go to, he gets called, Elijah gets called to this, this showdown almost at Mount Carmel. Showdown of between the prophets of Baal and, and Elijah. And they come, they get the oxen, they build these altars, and, and it's a crazy place, and he goes, okay, whoever, whoever's God can light the fire first, they, they're the real God. 
So they're like, okay, yeah. So the prophets of Baal are over here. They're over here calling down to their God. And then after like a while, he starts making fun of them. He starts going, what is he, sleeping? Is your God sleeping or something? Is he, is he on vacation? And so he's, after a while, they're cutting themselves, which was a ritual for them. And nothing happens. So Elijah over here built his altar. Same exact thing. Except they even had him dig trenches around the altar and poured water upon water upon water in these trenches. Okay, so God, he reaches out to God. He says, God, I need you right now. I need you to send fire down and light this, light this sacrifice up. Next thing you know, fire comes down and it burns everything. It burns the dirt, the rocks, the water, everything in there gets burnt up. And next thing you know, he's killing all the prophets of Baal. He killed all, the, all of them that were there and... This is where we pick up in chapter 19. Just after that, that, big, that big showdown, we pick up in chapter 19 where he is tra- traveling from Jezreel to Beersheba. And then another day's journey into the wilderness. So what was he doing where we find him now? What he was doing was running. He was running and actually he was praying to die. If you got that part, he was praying that he would die, which is crazy because... He had just called, prayed to God and called fire down from heaven. And just earlier in that chapter 2, he, had, he told Ahab, the king, that it was not going to rain for three and a half years until he said it was going to rain again. So he knew the power of prayer. He's seen prayer answered. He's seen those prayers answered. And still he sits there and he's walking and he says, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't take it anymore. Just take my life. For me, it was, it was hard to see someone like Elijah, a person of his status almost, be going through something like that. To be having a rough day. I mean, he just did all this stuff and now he's running from a threat. But he's having a rough day. But you know what? That gives me hope. It tells me that it's okay to have a rough day every once in a while. It's okay. We're not going to get it right every single time. It doesn't matter if you're just crawling out of a cave or coming down from the mountaintop. Sometimes you have a rough day. And I think it's easy at this point in Elijah's life and his story and all the things he had done already to almost see him as, as like a superhero. I, I see him as like a superhero. Like he can, dude, if you're calling down fire from heaven, bro, then uh, wow. Okay, I got you. I see you. I see you over there. I see you. But it's easy, it's easy to look at him differently because of all the things that he was doing. You know, I think a lot of times, even us as humans and Christians, we look at people that are that are doing things that either we want to do, or they're being successful in the things that God's called them to do, and we want that. We want that, and sometimes it's easy to look at them differently and go, "Oh, wow, they're better than us. They're wow. They, look at them. Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. They're doing better than we are." Elijah had moments where he didn't know what he wanted to do either. He didn't know what to do all the time. He didn't know what to do. So, two things that God showed me to give you today for this part of the story. For what your what. So, two things to get to know your what. If you want to know your what, there's two things that God gave me. First thing, to know your what, you need to have focus. Focus. You need to have focus to know your what. See, when Elijah chose to run, when he chose to run from the threat of Jezebel, he, he was running because he lost his focus. He was focusing on the obstacle that was in front of him that was Jezebel. He was focusing on that threat that was right here when God was right there the whole time. Instead of focusing on God, he was focusing on Jezebel and the threat to his life. You see, a lot... Hmm. The obstacle for Elijah was necessary to get him to where God needed him to be. The obstacle that was put there was was meant to bring him to where God needed him. God needed him in that desert and needed him in that wilderness. He just didn't know it at that time. See, your obstacle will never take you out unless you let it. It's not going to take you out. God's got you. If you let it take you out, he could have stayed there and... 
Jezebel could have killed them right there. Obstacle's not gonna let not gonna take you out unless you let it. David didn't let his obstacle take him out, named Goliath. <clears throat> Moses didn't let his obstacle named the Red Sea take him out. They went through it. <clears throat> they got through it. What did he do when he lost his focus? What did Elijah do when he lost his focus? He ran. And it, a lot of us do that. A lot of us do that. When we see something come up against us, our first instinct is just, I'm out. I'm running. I'm running. You know why? Because it's, it's easier to deal with. It's easier to run than deal with what, whatever the issue is. It's easier for me just to go, I'm out, than to stay back here and deal with what i got to deal with. It's easier to just run. When he ran, he didn't just run a little. It says he ran 80 miles. He ran 80 miles plus another day's journey into the wilderness. And then later on, he ran. He walked 40 days and nights to get to the mountain. Well, I started to wonder. I was like, hmm. I was like, is this the same Elijah that we see in chapter 19 that was in chapter 18? What happened from? chapter 19 to 18. What happened from him calling down fire from heaven to running from a threat throughout his life? What happened in that? Why? How did he go from Mount Carmel to the wilderness? Because he lost his focus. He lost his focus. And he had to be battling at this point so much depression and, and discouragement almost because I think he, I mean you would think that after a miracle like that, the whole point of that was to get the, the nation of Israel to convert and see who God was. The whole point of it was to get, the, the, get Israel to come to the knowledge and the realization that God is God. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. They turned and they still went their own ways. So that had to be hard to take. It's almost like a, a punch in the gut. Like you just did all this and then nothing. But it's a lot. It's a lot harder to. It's easy to tell to look at him and say, "Why did you run? Why did you run?" It's a lot harder when it's you or someone you love, right? Going through going through a nasty divorce, maybe after you just went to a marriage conference and saw a ray of light. After you just took a job and you you can't pay your bills and the debt collectors are calling. It's a lot harder when it's you. Well, you have to keep your focus. It's that moment where where you realize that things aren't going the way you thought they would. Elijah thought that would be the moment when Israel would come. Israel would come and realize who God was. Sometimes it's easier to run. I remember... Um, Last week, Pastor Warren was talking about focus, and after after service, I, I go up to him, I go, dude, you just stole my first point. What are you doing? I was, I'm preaching that next week. He goes, oh, sorry. I'm like, yeah, thanks. We talked about last week, focus on your promise, not your problem. Focus on your promise, not your problem, because your focus determines where you're going. If you remember at the beginning of the year, um, we do a corporate fast at the beginning of the year. And it was eight days long this year. Um, and Janelle and I had the chance to, um, to share one of the nights. And it was, it was awesome. It was an awesome night. And we're talking about next level. And God gave me a word for that night for us to share. And the one word God gave me to talk about that night was focus. It was focus. And I said something that God wanted me to share. And he, it was, uh, what the enemy can't destroy, he distracts. What the enemy can't destroy, he distracts. Now that means the enemy knows he can't destroy you. If he knows he can't destroy you, then he's going to distract you from building that relationship with your family, with your spouse, with the Lord, with you know doing all the things that he wants you to do. He's going to distract you from those if he can't destroy you. Even even Elijah's prayers changed once he got there, once he got to the got to the wilderness. You know, he prayed, he prayed to die, I think, because it was such a, a failure to him. It was a failure to him that he probably felt like a failure because 
It didn't happen the way he thought it was going to happen. It didn't happen like he thought it was. You know, but what you what you view as failure sometimes, what you see as failure may just be broken focus. What you view as failure may just be broken focus. What are you focusing on? He was focusing on what what he thought it would look like once Mount Carmel was over and settled. He was focusing on that. What you view as failure may just be broken focus. Second thing God gave me. To know your what. To know your what. You need to have direction. You need to have direction. I think sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do sometimes is just rest. I think sometimes you just need to rest. You know? What you're doing is so important. And if you aren't doing the right thing at the right right time, what are you really doing? If you're not doing the right thing at the right time, what are you really doing? What if Elijah was resting when he was supposed to be on Mount Carmel calling down fire from heaven? What if he was resting while he was supposed to be doing that? You see, Elijah, he, he runs all this way. He runs all 80 miles, another day's journey. And then we see him lay down and take a nap. We see him just lay down and rest. You know, and his physical, spiritual, emotional tank had to be empty at that point. I mean, you just go through all that stuff, you've got to be drained. I would be. I'm drained after one day of work, let alone walking 40 days and nights through, through the wilderness. It's interesting to me that, that the angels showed up to Elijah once he was asleep. Not while he was walking, not while he was worrying, not while he was complaining, not while he was wanting to die, praying to die. He showed up to Elijah once he was resting. Once he was asleep, he got woken up by the angel. So I asked myself, why why did God send his angel to meet Elijah when he was resting and sleeping? Seems like such an odd time, right? I mean, dude, let me sleep. Come on. I just did all this and now you're waking me up again in the middle of the night? It's because God knew where he was at. God knew where Elijah was at. He knew he needed rest. He knew he needed to process this whole event that just happened. Sometimes we don't take enough time to process the things that are happening in our life or things that have happened to us. Sometimes God knew he just needed a process and needed a minute to breathe, to catch up, catch up on some rest. You have to remember that when you're walking through a wilderness like Elijah, that you're never alone. That you're never alone. It says that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? He wasn't alone. See, God's not leaving you. He's leading you. God wasn't leaving him. He was leading him to there. He was leading him to the place where he got he could know more about him and more about him. More about him and more about him. Elijah was on the on the going to the place where he was going to learn so much and learn to hear God in a new way and learn so much about himself and he didn't even know it yet. He didn't even know where he was going yet. Little did he know that as we continue the series, later in the series, you'll hear what God did for him. What if what God wants you to do next requires you to go through a wilderness to get there? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go through that wilderness? Are you willing to go through that tough season, that tough spot to get to where God wants you to be? Are you willing to do that? He, at this point, too, he was he had listened to the lie the enemy had told him. He was listening to the lie. Because when you believe what the enemy is saying to you, when you believe what he's saying and the lies he's putting out, you're going to go in the wrong direction. The enemy doesn't want you going the right way. The enemy wants you going the wrong way. It's interesting because the Bible doesn't say God had him run into the wilderness. It doesn't say God had him run. All it says is Elijah saw how things were and ran for dear life to Beersheba. What if he was supposed to stay? What if he was supposed to stay? I've made a lot of bad choices. Have you ever made a bad choice? I've made a lot of bad What if that was just one of his, like, oh, 
dang, she didn't cut my head off. See ya. What if that was one of those? What if he was scared? What if he was supposed to stay? The moment you, when you feel insecure is when the enemy will try to sneak into your mind and tell you things that mess with you. Those moments, those little moments where you feel so insecure of everything that just happened will be when the enemy comes in and he's right here. Happens to me all the time. I guarantee you as soon as I get home today, I'm going to be talking to my wife and I'm going to be like, man, that was awful. Right here. He's talking to me. That was awful. What are you doing? What are you even doing there? What are you even doing? Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Oh my goodness, that was awful. Did you see anybody? Oh man, that was, that was bad. It'll be right there as soon as I get home. As soon as I leave this place, it'll be right here. It'll be right here talking to me. What do you do with that? Are you going to run? Which way are you going to run? Which way are you going to run? You know, I, I always had this view. I grew up in the church. I always had this view of leadership. Like, like they had it all together. You know, like they had it. Like I never saw nothing wrong with them. I grew up, grew up in the church. And I was like, oh man, they're, they're way better. Someday I want to I want to be up there like doing that. Listen, what I don't know what you think of of leadership right now, but we mess up too. Pastor Derek will be the first one to admit to you that he messes up. You know, we all mess up too. We're not perfect. We still have insecurities. We still have those things that we look to God and we're like, God, you better help us. You better help me. I don't know what I'm doing. We still have those things that we have to get down on our knees and pray to God and say, God, you better take this. you got to take this from me because I don't know what to do. You have to do this because I can't. You have to be that person that I can't be, God. Leaders have, you know, the little ear that the devil hits in your head, on your shoulder? We got it too. We got it too. We struggle just like the rest of you. We struggle just like everyone else. We're just humans too. So what's your what? What's your what? Maybe, maybe it's a, a bigger what? A bigger calling, like your life calling, or maybe it's just for today. Maybe it's just for one day. What was what's your what for that day? Like my what for that one day on that field trip was just to give that little girl a little ray of light. I really believe that. I really believe that that was my what for the day. It cost me six dollars. Who cares? What's six dollars in the long run, right? What's your what? What is your what? That's where we're starting the series today, because before we keep going, you need to know your what is. Before we continue on in this journey and follow Elijah into the next steps and the rest of the story and see where God takes him, you got to know your what. you got to know your what. Just for today, from day to day, and your big what. What is your purpose? What did God put you here to do? Maybe you don't know what your what is today. It's okay. That's okay. It took me a long time. I ran from my what, actually. I ran from my what. About four years ago, I wasn't even in here. I wasn't even in this building. I ran so far away from my what. I ran as far as I could. I ran. I booked it. I probably went 80 miles too. And then another day into the wilderness. I ran from my what. I knew what my what was. I grew up in this. I've been spoken over many times of what God had for me. And I still ran. I still ran. Still ran for my what? Stay with me this morning. Well, the thought came to me that this is like a like a shifting season for Elijah, a shifting moment. You know, maybe God was shifting Elijah from the peak of Mount Carmel into the cave at Horeb, taking him from calling down fire to the dark loneliness of the cave. But God was there the whole time. He was there the whole time. 
He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But he was, he was in that moment, he was preparing him. He was preparing Elijah for what he was going to do later on. He was, but you don't see that. You don't see that in the moment. You don't see it as preparation. You see it as pain. But really, he was preparing Elijah this whole time, this whole journey, the whole 80 miles, the whole 40 days walking, 40 days and nights walking, 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 walking. He was preparing him. He was preparing him for what he had for him. So maybe you're running today. Maybe today you're running like I ran. We've all run. Which way are you running? Which way are you running today? Are you running what from what seems to be a threat? Maybe you're running from someone or something. God's preparing you for something. Even in your running. Sometimes we need to run. Sometimes we need to run to see what God has for us. If Elijah never ran and he never made it all that way, he would never make it to to Horeb. And he would never live out the rest of the story. God used his running. He used the running. Have the leadership come up. You're ready to pray. You know, a lot of people in your life are going to try and tell you what your what is. You'll have a lot of people tell you what they think your what is. So what and who do you let speak into your life? What and who are the ones putting that in your head? Telling you what your what is? Do you know your what? What's your what this morning? What I've come to realize is that God doesn't ask us questions because He needs the answers. He didn't say, hey Elijah, what are you doing here? Because He didn't know. He didn't say, Elijah, what are you doing here? Because God didn't know the answer. He he needed to ask it so Elijah would know the answer. He doesn't ask it for him, He asks it for us. He asked Elijah that question so he would do a self-reflection for a minute and say, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here today? What's your what? Maybe he's asking you what's your what to give you focus this morning. Maybe you just need to refocus a little bit. Maybe you need a new prescription on your on your glasses you're looking through. You need to refocus them things, okay? Maybe he's asking you what's your what so he can give you direction. Which way? Which way do you go? Which way? If you need prayer this morning, please don't hesitate to come up. What's your what? Lord, thank you. Thank you for your revelations this morning. Lord, thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. Lord, I pray for every person in here that they they seek you to find out what their what is. What's their purpose? Lord, I pray that you just touch every heart in here and tell them what their what is. If you want to know what your what is, come up and get some prayer. If you need some direction, if you need to get refocused this morning, it's okay. It's okay. We all go through it. We all need to get refocused from time to time. Are you running this morning? Are you running the wrong way and need to come back and turn the right way again?
God's preparing you for something. 